Welcome to The Backstory with Dr. Ricky Singh. This podcast is focused on bringing you the latest research-based information about dramatically improving health, well-being, and quality of life. And here's your host, Dr. Ricky Singh. Over the past several years, the risk of concussion in sports has received a great deal of attention. You know, while concussion among athletes has always existed, reports of long-term damage to the brains of NFL players as well as professional boxers has really come into the media recently. My guest today is an associate professor of neurology and specializes in epilepsy, concussion, and traumatic brain injury. He is also the chief medical officer of the New York State Athletic Commission and is a certified ringside physician. He has served as the head physician for UFC, Ultimate Fighting Championships, as well as boxing. Please welcome Dr. Nitin Sethi. Nitin, how are you? I'm good, Ricky. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us all the way from New Delhi, India. So this is a international exposure for us. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sethi, you're, you're a physician. You're a neurologist. You know, the, the organ that you work most hard to protect is the brain. Yet you work as a ringside physician. You're there for boxers and fighters whose kind of job it is to essentially destroy the other person's brain. You know, how do you kind of reconcile this? And tell me, how did you first get interested in this work with brain injury? Well, Ricky, I'll I'll take your second question first. I was actually born in Buffalo, New York, but I was raised in India. And when I first came to to New York in, uh, in 2003, joined my residency in neurology, I really knew nobody in the city. One day after finishing my call, I just managed to go to a gym and I walked into a boxing class. And uh, that's where I met my first trainer, Tyrone. He saw me peeping in. He said, do you want to box? I said, yeah, I'll box. And that was how my, I would say, my love of favorite boxing started. I found the sport fascinating. Uh, I took it up seriously. And I've been boxing since then. So I've been myself been boxing for a long time. At some point in time, during my, my residency training, I got interested in traumatic brain injuries, concussions. So, you know, I, I basically wanted to bring my two passions together. So I applied to the New York State Athletic Commission. The New York State Athletic Commission is the commission which regulates professional boxing and MMA in the state of New York. So all professional boxing, all professional MMA events come under this commission. So I applied to the New York State Athletic Commission saying I want to work as a ringside physician. You know, they agreed and I started working as a ringside physician. And then in 2016, it was my, it's my privilege that they asked me to become the chief medical officer. And that's the position I currently serve in. You know, that's how this whole thing started. I am very passionate about making the sports safer. So coming to your first question, yeah, you know, it's fascinating that combat sports like boxing, MMA, and certainly boxing, you know, every punch thrown at the head, right, you rightly said, is thrown with the idea of winning by causing a KO, which, as as we all know, is basically a concussion. So, you know, every punch thrown at the head is thrown with the idea of causing a concussion. And so combat sports uh, are really, you see a lot of concussions, you'll see mild concussions, you'll see moderate concussions, you'll see severe concussions. And I am very passionate that these sports can be made safer. I use my words carefully. I don't think so combat sports can be made completely safe. The sport is basically involves punching the other person's head. But I certainly believe that they can be made more safer than what they are right now. You know, you you bring up your exposure to boxing. And there's no question that we have seen, in, even in our clinic, the cardiovascular benefits of boxing. Certainly from an endurance perspective, from a muscle muscle building perspective. But the question comes in, when you're hitting a bag, the bag's not hitting you back, there's benefit. The second you put an opponent into the ring whose job it is, just like you said, to deliver a knockout to his opponent and cause these mild traumatic brain injuries, that's when people like myself in physiatry and rehabilitation medicine kind of get concerned. You know, you bring up this word concussion. What is a concussion? What does that mean? What does it look like? Symptoms that patient presents with? Just give give our listeners an overall assessment of what a concussion is. Sure. So think about concussion as a closed head injury. So when something hits your head, you know, uh, the head is protected by a rigid skull bone. So pretty much most of the force is absorbed by the skull. 
but some amount of force gets transmitted across the brain. So it's a closed head injury. It's unlike like a gunshot wound to the head where the bullet is physically going to the brain, damaging brain tissue. In concussion, nothing physically goes to the brain. It's just a transmission of forces. And a good way to look at concussions is combat sports like boxing, MMA, or even contact sports like football. You see a lot of concussions and you can divide them into a mild concussion, a moderate and a severe concussion. I'll share a few examples. A mild concussion, a boxer walks into a stiff jab or a boxer walks into a right. Or on the football field, you see a helmet to helmet contact. He, he'll just be stunned for a few seconds. A lot of these NFL players will say, I felt my bell being rung. But there's no loss of consciousness. The ref says, are you OK? Most of the time they say, I'm fine. And the game goes on. So the definitions of concussions have changed over the years. You don't need to have loss of consciousness for a concussion to occur. You could be walking into out of a room, you walk right into the door, you see the stars, and that might be a mild concussion. Now contrast that to like a moderate concussion, like a perfect example for moderate concussion, a knockout in boxing. A, a boxer is knocked out, he or she is lying on the canvas. They are not able to get up before the count of 10. The fight is stopped by the ref. If you happen to be a ringside physician like me, when we jump into the ring, initially we'll find the box is unconscious. But they're unconscious for a very few seconds, 15, 20 seconds. Very rapidly, they'll open their eyes. But when they open their eyes, you'll find them confused and disoriented. So if you ask him questions, do you know where you are, sir? He doesn't know he's in Madison Square Garden. Do you know whom you're fighting? He doesn't know whom he's fighting. You give them a few minutes, they clear up. And then they say, hey, doc, I'm fine. I know where I am. Let me get up fight is over. So that's like a moderate concussion. Now contrast that to a severe concussion. For example, a patient I saw, she, you know, she came down, she's crossing the avenue, she's hit by one of these e-bikes. We all see these e-bikes in New York. Unfortunately, she goes up, she, she falls down, head hits the cement, and she has a complete loss of consciousness. That person doesn't know anything till she reached the hospital. So a severe concussion, a much longer period of loss of consciousness, a much longer period of confusion and disorientation. And that's basically what a concussion is. And it's important to realize it can be a mild concussion, which may be very subtle, a moderate and a more severe concussion. You know, this, uh, I think the conversation of concussion, at least in, in our training, really started to get some traction and we really started to pay more attention to it. I believe based a lot on the work that a very famous forensic neuropathologist, Dr. Bennett Amalu talked about at UPMC. And that's kind of what that movie Concussion is based on with Will Smith. And they talk about cumulative concussions, whether many, many mild or a few moderate or a couple severe leading to this condition called CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Tell our listeners a little bit about what is CTE? I mean, does it only affect these combat sports like boxers and football players? Or can that elderly person who has multiple small falls develop something like CTE? Ricky, you asked a great question. Uh, occasionally in the concussion center at a hospital in Cornell, as you know, we find some people coming in with concerns that they have CTE. So I would like to take some time to explain, explain to your listeners what it is. The term CTE, people should understand, is not unique to football. Like you said, it became popular. You know, People came to know about it because of the movie Concussion. Uh, but if you look at the boxing literature, CTE has been described in boxing long, long, long back, in, as early as in the 1800s. You know, uh, Professor Mutland, who was a medical examiner in New Jersey, he described what is called as a dementia pugilistica or punch drunk syndrome. So boxing literature, you'll see dementia pugilistica. Boxers who've been boxing for many, many years, especially who are called sluggers. You know, they stand in the pocket. They, you hit me, I'll hit you even harder. You hit me, I'll hit you, hit you, hit you even harder. I'm not talking about a defensive boxer like Floyd Mayweather. You couldn't even land a punch on him. This is a guy who just stands in the pocket, says, give me your best shot and I'll hit you with my best shot. So Professor Martin found that in, in, a, in some of these boxes, he found there was when they did brain cutting. And that's not, another thing which listeners need to understand. The diagnosis of CTE is made after you have died. 
when the brain is looked at at autopsy, you find this deposition of this protein in the brain, and that's where dementia pugilistica came. Boxing literature has very colorful terms, punch drunk syndrome, slug nutty. This is a very common term in the gyms. You know, he's slug nutty. You know, he's been slugged so many times, he's, he's, he's nutty in his head. <laughs> cuckoo, you know, you got, you, he's cuckoo now. So, you know, it was a term which, it, this is a disease which probably has been there in combat sports, especially boxing. The, the thing is that it usually comes to medical attention when the boxer's career is over. So we are talking about a boxer who is now retired, you know, late 30s, early 40s. And you'll find that, you know, they start having memory problems, cognitive problems, attention, concentration, things like that. And then they'll have mood and behavioral changes, like, you know, a little bit of changes in mood, aggression, uh, depression, anxiety. And then obviously you can also see some sort of strange movements. Like, you know, if you look at things like Parkinsonian like movements, they are, you know, uh, what's called the punch drunk gait, the way they walk. So that's how this whole thing, you know, kind of presents. It presents after the career is over. So even with the NFL, you know, when these brains were looked at of these NFL players who were retired, and, for, uh, and as we know, sadly, some of them had actually taken their own life and the brain had been donated. And at autopsy, this disease was further described. So the point I'm trying to make here is it's not unique to football. So you can make the argument if, that if somebody has had multiple concussions in their lifetime, and we talked about mild concussions, moderate and severe concussions. So occasionally you'll have patients coming to me and saying, hey, Dr. Sethi, I played football in high school. I, I, you know, I played rugby. I got so many concussions. A lot of them were mild. Now at 35, 40 years of age, I'm having memory problems. I get very, I lose my temper, um, changes in mood and behavior. Do you think I have CTE? So yeah, that concern is raised. And then you really need to figure out how can we kind of go about figuring out if that's, that's really valid or not. So that brings me to a two part question. In the individual who has sustained multiple mild concussions throughout their career, whether it was high school football or rugby, like you mentioned, at what point do you as the physician or a healthcare provider tell this person, you know what, I think we need to stop playing this sport so that you don't develop CTE or memory or cognitive issues in the future? Again, Ricky, I've written extensively about this. How do you prognosticate somebody, especially a professional athlete, about brain health? You know, remember, like just say you and me are doctors, it's like telling you, Ricky, you're not going to practice medicine anymore. It's a big decision if you tell somebody, a professional boxer, a professional MMA athlete, these are elite athletes, a professional football player, that's their life. You're telling them no more, no mass, as they say in boxing, no mass, okay? But how do you go about prognosticating it? And there's a lot which is involved in this. You know, it's not a decision you make lightly, a good history figuring out exactly how many concussions the, the athlete might have sustained, how many of them were mild concussions, moderate, severe concussions. And then there are a few tests which you can do to try to figure out their brain health. Like for example, a good quality MRI of the brain. Do you see any, any evidence of prior head injuries? Do you see any micro bleeds in the brain? Uh, you know, do you see any atrophy in the brain? Has the brain, does the, how does the brain look? It's, as you know, the MRI is really good at giving a picture of the brain. So one would be a good MRI of the brain. Second thing will be something called as a formal neurocognitive evaluation. Let me tell you what exactly that is. Like nowadays, every NFL player before the start of the season, he will have a neurocognitive evaluation. They do it on the computer. It's called an impact test. But the test is geared to look at attention, concentration, memory, short-term memory, verbal memory. You get baselines on the athlete. Now, let's assume that player gets concussed. He's not allowed to return back to the game till he takes the neurocognitive evaluation again and he's back at his baseline. So a point I'm trying to make here is if you're doing serial neurocognitive evaluation and if you find that over the years a boxer's cognitive scores are declining, that's the time you might prognosticate and say, listen, maybe it's time to hang up your gloves. So MRIs, 
neurocognitive evaluation. These are a couple of the tests which can be done to prognosticate athletes and even people like you and me who might be playing these sports, not in a professional level, but we might be getting concussed about how to go about making it safer. You know, you, you bring up a good point. A few years ago, we had a panel with current and formal NFL players regarding this topic. And when the concussion protocol started coming out, you know, five, six, ten years ago, we as the healthcare providers were were suggesting and implementing the concussion protocol for the patient's safety. But just like you said, a lot of these athletes said, listen, my career is six to ten years long. And for every week or two weeks that you hold me from from playing, that's my that's the way I make a living. And so there was definitely a disconnect in the safety that we're trying to provide for them and their desire to pursue these sports, knowing that there is some inherent risk in long-term outcomes. So in those patients that, let's say, have now presented to you after they've retired from boxing or football or another combat contact sport, and they're developing these neurocognitive issues, what can you do at that point? Are there interventions that you can slow the progression or even reverse some of these symptoms? So first and foremost, like I said, we discussed a couple of tests which you can do to get baselines, good MRI, a formal neurocognitive evaluation. So this is a neurocognitive evaluation done by us by a trained neuropsychologist. As you know, in our center, we have a couple of them. You know, it's unlike the tests which they do on the computer. This is much more formal. It takes four hours to do. Battery of tests designed to look at attention, concentration, memory, short-term memory, verbal memory. They also throw in a few tests designed to look at the health of the mind, anxiety scores, depression scores. So you get a good, you get a good feel of the patient's brain health. Now, a few things which are important and which I feel anybody can do no matter whether they have sustained concussions or not, uh, whether they play professionally or on an amateur level, to preserve their brain health. So, like for example, we all know that the brain is a muscle. The more you exercise a muscle, the better it is for the brain. So, use it or lose it has scientific uh, validity. You know, so they should remain cognitively engaged. You know, whether it's reading, writing, listening to music, learning a new instrument. Uh, you know, the more you use your brain, the more is your cognitive reserve, the more protected you are from these diseases later on. They're sort of like neurodegenerative diseases. So that's important. I think we should prognosticate these people to maintain their brain health in that way. There are a few supplements out there. Magnesium oxide is thought to be good for the brain. You can take magnesium oxide, some vitamin B12, some fish oil. They're all good. Things like brain healthy diet. Food made in extra virgin olive oil, plenty of nuts, less of red meat, more of vegetables, more of fish. If that person likes to drink red wine, better than like hard liquor. You know, so there are ways you can maintain the brain health. Anxiety, depression, mental health is very important. We have a lot of data coming out that mental health, anxiety, depression kills brain cells. So try to improve the mental health. So, you know, the idea is to try to bring, build up the cognitive reserve uh, and try to slow down the stem or the, the progression of, uh, of these injuries. The, the way I explain to some of my patients, I say, listen, your brain took a hit. It's your most precious organ. You now want to nurture it and nourish it. You want it to again recover. Okay. And that's what it is. You know, one important point, which you and I deal with all the time. Like, for example, I told you I'm passionate about boxing. I've been boxing 15 years. But I was also wise enough to re realize that this is not what I'm going to do for a living. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm not going to be Floyd Mayweather. So at some point in time, I, I'm, I did not spar. I, you know, I, do, I go and work out on the back. Like you said, the back doesn't hit you back. I look very good on the back, but I'm not, you know, I'm not putting myself in harm's way. So the point I'm trying to make is somebody is doing it on an amateur level. I think they have to be, you have to make them realize that, listen, why put yourself in the harm's way? If you are going to do some sort of exercise, it's more for health and health benefits. Why spar? Why do you go to the gym and start sparring with somebody? You might get concussed. But, you know, these are, these are individual discussions you have with the person and then you make a call. You know, a, a lot of the cases that we've seen in concussion are surrounding contact sports and combat sports, such as football, boxing, wrestling. You know, but we see patients coming in who don't participate in those sports, like the elderly person who falls. Even in other sports like soccer, especially women's soccer, 
or I've seen some young men who are surfing who get hit in the head with a surfboard and come in with concussion. Are you seeing patients that are not boxers and football players coming in with concussions? And then what do you, how do you counsel those patients on, again, maintaining healthy brain environment? Sure, absolutely. In fact, the vast majority of patients who come to the concussion center are not professional boxers or, you know, combatants and all. They'll be people like you and me, somebody suddenly getting up, bumps it has bumps his or her head against the, the desk, an older patient, elderly patient falling down, sleeping in the bathroom. I mentioned give you the example of somebody crossing the street and gets unfortunately hit by some an e-bike or something like that. So concussions are common. I do see them in lacrosse, women's soccer, uh, you know, whole variety of sports you can get concussed. Uh, and, and the basic, I think the basic things are education, education, education. One thing that people have to realize that concussions can be very subtle. I gave you the example. Boxer walks into a stiff jab, helmet to helmet contact. For a few seconds, you are stunned. You felt your bell being rung, and that might be a mild concussion. A lot of people don't realize that they've had a mild concussion until they start having the headache and the post-concussion symptoms, like a little bit of dizziness, lights are bothering them, sounds are bothering them, they feel slightly off. That's the time they'll go to an urgent care or something like come to you and me and say, listen, I think something happened. So a lot is education. And then, you know, most concussion symptoms will heal by themselves. It's a self-limited disease process. Usually you recover. The idea is give initially when you have a concussion, and this will be useful to your listeners. Initially, when you have a concussion, you give the brain a few days of cognitive rest and physical rest. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's assume somebody has a concussion on the NFL field, uh, football game. We pull the player out. We examine him on the sideline. And if we feel he's concussed, we do a, neuro, we do a neurological examination, balance test. And if we feel he's concussed, we say, listen, you're benched. Benching means is you don't, you're not going to let a concussed athlete go back into the game. This is important. If somebody gets concussed or feels they are concussed while playing soccer, you know, just an amateur league, something like that, make sure you realize it because it's it's very subjective. Even your athletic trainer or your coach on the sideline may not know you've been concussed. Pull yourself out and then they are benched. That means you give them a period of cognitive rest and physical rest. Cognitive rest will mean like little less of TV, less of watching screens, working on your computer. And physical rest will be, well, you're not going to go back and start running, uh, you know, running again. After a few days of rest, you begin a graded and gradual return back to the work and exercise. That's basically the main sort of the treatment of concussion, you know, cognitive and physical rest, and then a graded return back to work. You know, one thing that we do really well in medicine, especially in the Western medicine, is wait for pathology to occur, and then we intervene and we treat. You know, we wait for, in my world, back pain and disc herniations, and then I can step in. You wait potentially for a mild brain injury or concussion, and then you intervene. You know, you brought up something about making these sports safer. And, you know, in the NFL, they've taken different steps like uh, equipment changes, technology in the helmets different rules on the field, like helmet to helmet contact or fair catch. How do you make boxing safer? How can you actually implement some strategies to maybe prevent concussion? Or is it that you intervene quickly to prevent the second impact? Right, uh, Ricky, it's it's subject very close to uh, uh, close to my heart. I'm very passionate about it. How do you make boxing safer? How do you make a sport safer where every punch thrown to the head is thrown with the idea of causing a concussion? I strongly believe boxing can be made safer, though a lot of our colleagues, you know, might might say disagree that boxing can never be made safer. And I want people to realize that most medical associations, including the American Medical Association, the British Medical Association, at some point or the other have made a call to ban boxing. But boxing cannot be banned. Boxing will continue. It's continued for years. So I feel strongly that doctors should step up and try to make it safer. And how do you make it safer? Like you said, now you might say, listen, can we change the change the law? Like for example, no punches to the head. Now, if you make professional boxing, you say there will be no punches to the head, you can only throw punches to the body, you change the very nature of the sport. So that's not going to be acceptable. So 
then what you can do is one thing which very close medical supervision of these fights as they're happening. When you see a box is, is, is concussed, when does a doctor step in or a referee step in and stop the fight? Okay, when do you allow a fighter not to continue? Uh, those are tragedies have occurred in the ring where a boxer has suffered severe traumatic brain injury. We need to make sure that boxing, sports like MMA, football are very closely supervised by doctors. Athletes need to be educated. Like I said, uh, a lot of times you need to, the athlete needs to know when he, he or she is concussed because a concussion may be very mild. The symptoms are all subjective. It's not like you have a stroke, your arm is paralyzed, and everybody can see it from a distance. These are subjective complaints. I have a headache. He, he hit me. Now I feel a little headachy. I'm, you know, my vision is slightly off. I feel my subjective feeling. I feel my balance is off. Lights are bothering me. If you don't tell me that, I'll not know that he might be concussed. So education, education, education. Referees should know. Athletic trainers, coaches should know what a concussion is, how to recognize it, and when you bring the player out. I think the NFL, things have happened. You know, they really, really worked hard to make the sport safer. Like earlier on, it was like you had a helmet to helmet contact, you shake it off and the game continues. Now, if you feel something, say something, come out, be assessed. That culture needs to change. And that change will come, I feel strongly, with education. And, and that education, I think, will, be the, will sort of be the cornerstone of that. You know, I'm going to ask you a, a difficult question, a question that my wife and I discuss a lot about is, you know, we have a one-year-old son who's a big kid relatively for his age. And we kind of blanket said, we're not going to let my son play football or box. Do you think that's a premature decision? And what would you do if your family members, your nieces, nephew, kids asked that they want to box or play football? How, did you, how would you respond to that question? Uh, well, Ricky, uh, I think it's in the end, it's a very individual decision which a parent takes for his, children, his, his kid. So I would not intrude on that. But... Personally, if my son wants to box, I would say, yes, go ahead, box, because I, I think it's a great sport. I, boxing has meant so much to me. But I would educate him or her. Uh, if my daughter wants to box, I would tell them how to recognize concussions. I would make sure that they are closely supervised as they go through it. I think no, you know, concussions, like you said, can happen in any sport. I also believe that you should not restrict the child from his or her pa passion. You know, some, some I, I, you know, you, you see patients, they're so passionate about something. And you'll say, oh, this, is, this is what I, you know, I love playing this game. That's my life. So I think that's what it is, you know. Yes, but every, you know, like for us as doctors, we worry about catching like something like hepatitis B or hepatitis C if you're dealing with blood. Same way, athletes need to realize that there are certain risks associated with their sports especially in combat sports and in contact sports like football, the risk of traumatic brain injury, whether mild or severe, is always there. And we educate them and then we, you know, uh, you know, we let them make the call. Yeah, I, I appreciate what you're saying about individual decisions. You know, I, I see patients who like to participate in uh, CrossFit or they do soul cycle and spin. And I know that's bad for their back given their pathology, given that the fact they have a disc herniation. And certainly I could easily say, stop doing that activity. I know that's not what they want to hear and their passion is to participate. So my job as their physician is to educate them on how to do it safely, when to take a step back from that activity, when they see injuries occurring. So just like what you're saying with boxing and football. So I certainly appreciate uh, how you would respond to that question. Looking into the future, five to 10 years, what are you most excited about in the field of concussion, whether it's diagnostics or treatment or long-term outcome? Where do you see the field of concussion in sports going? I think the future lies in finding a biomarker for concussion. So a lot of people don't realize that we don't have a biomarker for concussions. For your listeners, like, for example, a patient comes to me and says, Dr. Sethi, I'm worried I have hepatitis C. Do a blood test. If it's positive, I'll say, I'm sorry to inform you, you do have hepatitis C. If it's negative, I'll say, I reassure you, 200 person, you don't have hepatitis C. We don't have a biomarker for concussion. So somebody comes to me and say, 
I'm concussed. You don't have any blood tests you can do on the blood or on the spinal fluid. Are you still concussed? How concussed are you? Are the numbers becoming better? Are they becoming worse? So in the absence of, I think that's where the field is heading, finding a good biomarker. And think about, like, let's think about the Super Bowl. Big game, the quarterback suffers a helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact. He comes out, that, you know, you do a quick blood test or quick test on the sideline, not concussed, good news, go back. Concussed, I'm sorry, you got to sit down. So that would be the ideal biomarker, something which can be done on the sidelines, quickly, standardized, gives you an answer. So there's a lot of research going on in biomarkers for concussion. That's one thing. That's the diagnostic. I think with respect to the treatment, also we are looking at things which are neuroprotective. How do you protect the brain? How do you protect the brain from these mild, mild, mild head injuries? Are there things you can take which might help? So that's one other thing which is going. So I feel that in the therapeutics, we'll also have some sort of thing which might come out, which might be neuroprotective or which might cause actually healing of a brain which has been injured. Uh, and that and, and a lot of people don't realize a lot of research in concussion has not been driven by combat sports or contact sports like football. It's been driven by the Department of Defense. Concussion is the signature injury of the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan. When our soldiers go out, and the IED goes off, they get a concussive blast. So mild TBIs, severe TBIs, unfortunately, the signature injuries of the Iraq, of the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan. That's why the advanced combat helmets nowadays have a pressure gauge. You know exactly how much concussive force the, 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 the soldier received. So I think that's where the field of concussion is heading, uh, how to diagnose it better and then how to treat it better and then how to protect the brain. Those are fantastic thoughts and uh, prognostication of where that field is going. I certainly agree with you in the realm of biomarkers. We could do a better job of that in the spine and disc herniation world as well. You know, Dr. Saiti, I love how passionate you are about concussion. You are an athlete yourself. You participate in the same sport that you are protecting your patients from. And it's rare to see that level of passion from a physician in, in a sport specifically. So I, I certainly appreciate that. I want to take time to just say thank you for spending time with us, educating us on concussion and mild brain injury regarding boxing, regarding football. I wish you and your family a happy Diwali in India. And uh, again, thank you for spending time with us today. Ricky, it was my pleasure. And it's an honor. thank you for the honor for letting me speak to your listeners. I wish everybody... Happy Diwali if you're Indian. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, please uh, uh, stay safe and good health uh, to everybody. Thank you, Nathan. Be well. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Backstory. Please subscribe, rate the podcast, and review The Backstory on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play Music. And feel free to share this podcast on social media or even your own website or blog. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. To learn more about Dr. Singh and his clinical research, please follow him on social media. You can also sign up for his newsletter by going to www.rickysinghmd.com. That's R-I-C-K-Y. S-I-N-G-H-M-D dot com.